The Atheist Debates Patreon Project presents Religion and Fear. So recently I was in Puerto Rico for the American Atheist Regional Convention there, and I gave a talk about religion and fear, and I thought it would be a good idea to include this as part of the Atheist Debates Project, because while it isn't an actual argument, it does get to the heart, in many cases, of what makes religion work and why it is so appealing and why even reasonable people with a good understanding of the world don't always find their way free of the trappings of superstitions and religious thought. And I want to start with somewhat of a disclaimer. I'm going to be speaking in kind of general terms and of course what I'm saying isn't the totality of what religion is about. It's not the entirety of its appeal to people. It's one aspect of it. I think it's a rather huge aspect that ties to our psyche and everything about us. And the other thing is to not make the mistake of when you hear someone speak about religions as if they have intent uh, or goals, or if they're particularly tuned to be good at something, don't make the mistake of seeing agency there and viewing religion as if it's some sort of uh, simple control mechanism, uh, as if there's some other mind, some other intent using religion to control others. As far as I can tell, religions are things that we've constructed. They're the result of errors in our thinking. They're the result of wanting uh, to ease our discomfort with various fears and anxieties, and they seem to have built up um, in a rather evolutionary process to the point where the ones that were best at alleviating fears, the ones that were best at offering people hope and reasons and comfort are the ones that survived. And yes, there's a, a bunch of things that we've added to them, um, but don't take this generalization and oversimplify it to the point where we could say, religion is just a tool to control people and ease their fears. I think it's a big part of it. But what kind of fears are we talking about here? Uh, I made a list of some of the most common fears that I think religion you know, attempts to address. Uh, the first one is a fear of the unknown. What's around that corner? What's behind that bush? What's somebody else doing? Um, why are we here? What, you know, how, where did all this come from? All of the, the, the fears that we're going to talk about uh, seem to come back to a fear of the unknown at some level or another. And you would think that as we learn more about the world, fear of the unknown would begin to dissipate. After all, we understand far more now than we did in the early days of thought. But that's not quite the case. Because as we learn more, we also learn that there's much more to learn. And we begin to understand that uh, if we were to list the things we thought we could possibly know and didn't a thousand years ago, that list is vastly longer now. And yet we know more. Because each thing we begin to understand, each thing that we gain some comprehension, some understanding of, leads us to the realization that there are many other aspects of this and many other areas in which we simply don't know. And religions have eased this fear by claiming that there is some being other than us who understands everything and understands it perfectly. It's no wonder that this is comforting, much the same way that when you're a child you don't understand much about the world, but you are not absolutely terrified. In fact, Quite often children have a sense of adventure that is, is sort of beaten out of them by the time they reach adulthood. And the comfort that comes from belief that your parents understand the things you don't, whether they actually do or not, is real. It eases your discomfort with not knowing. Now the good news is that religions are destined to fail on this ground. And that's because as we solve each mystery, we find that it was solved not by divine revelation, not by uh, wisdom in an ancient book, uh, but by people who bravely explored the world. 
the people who said, no, that answer is not good enough. No, I'm not going to be satisfied uh, with just simply saying we don't know and perhaps we can't ever know. Uh, and no, I'm not willing to accept your religion's claim about what the truth is. I need actual evidence. And these individuals went out and found better explanations. They created uh, better arguments. They investigated. They sought out other people to verify the results. And they compiled evidence in order to build a model of the world that increased their understanding. On the fear of the unknown, religions are doomed to fail. Because as we learn more, the things that we have to be afraid of as far as unknowns, begin to diminish. Even when we begin to understand that there are far more things unknown than we would have previously imagined, our discomfort with not knowing begins to fade because we have a newfound confidence that, first of all, we may be able to understand some of these things if we work at it. And secondly, the things that we don't understand we only know that we don't understand them because we understand other things. We're never going to eliminate fear of the unknown, most likely. It's part of our psyche and it'll be around forever. But how we deal with it and how we view a fear of the unknown can change dramatically. And if you're not as worried, if you're not as uncomfortable with saying, I don't know, and as you change the world so that people in general are more comfortable with saying, I don't know, then there's less stigma applied to not knowing and less stigma applied to saying, I don't know. And when that happens, you no longer need a magical friend who knows everything, especially when you begin to realize that this magical friend's knowledge of everything doesn't benefit you in any way. It's not like they're passing on information to you. So one of the other big fears that religions kind of try to ease is this fear of people who are different from us, people of different ethnicities, people with different social structures, different cultures, people who speak languages that we don't understand, people who seem to see the world in a way that's different from the way we see it. And religions have traditionally tried to resolve this fear uh, by making people similar, by telling people how to live, what to think, um, what to believe. It encourages a sort of uniformity that de-emphasizes the differences between people. There's a big problem with this though, and it's the reason that religion is doomed to fail on this ground as well. And that is when you view uh, the differences in people throughout history and even now, what you actually have is this broad spectrum. There's a great uh, diversity of views and ideas and languages and cultures. But religions, by bringing people together into little groups, started to broaden the delineation between groups of people. And so now those people who became Christians um, fit into one little group, and the people who became Muslims fit into another group, and the people who uh, follow Scientology or Zoroastrianism or Hinduism or whatever. Instead of having this broad spectrum where we can see all the differences and where there is far more overlap, where we're able to identify, uh, yes, you and I might disagree on this, but we agree on this, this, and this. Religions have basically lumped people into discrete grayscale tones so that the differences are more pronounced and so that the, the true differences between us are less obvious. And what this does is it encourages othering. Uh, oh, this is who we are and you are something else. And so that has encouraged wars and feuding for millennium. Um, as we break down borders, as we merge families and intermarry, uh, as we live in a world where there's instant communication, where there is rapid travel, where information is available to more and more people, where many of us, unless we're living in a little pocket society, are in the position of interacting with people on a nearly a daily basis who are potentially very different from us, we not only ease away from the fears of differences, we begin to embrace them. Uh, in some cases, we do it so much that we're co-opting somebody else's culture, and that might actually cause a problem as well. On the fear of strangers, religion isn't just doomed to fail. 
it's actually part of the problem. This discrete delineation of us and them that each one of them makes uh, is part of the problem. Instead of seeing the overlap, now all we see are the gaps. You're different from me because of X, Y, and Z. Now, this isn't a product of religion, it's a product of who we are. We still struggle and will probably continue to struggle with racism, sexism, classism. Right now, the way we're, we're trying to understand and deal with transgendered people is perhaps atrocious by most standards. And that's not the cause, that's not the fault of religion, although I think religions have exacerbated this problem by creating and, and pronouncing uh, and emphasizing the differences and the divides between us. But I think we can get through this, and we will. And as we begin to embrace the differences, we learn more about the similarities as well. And we're less fearful. And we might not need some religious model or superstitious model to put us all in neat little boxes. Uh, so that we're not afraid of the people who are different from us. This may be a fear that we can get over with, and get over, just by continuing to try to understand other people and interact with them. So one of the other fears that religions tend to attempt to ease is our fear of uncertainty. Much like our fear of the unknown, the fear of uncertainty is this idea that we want to, to have an incredibly high confidence level. We'd like to be absolutely certain about the things that we know and think we know. And yet, this doesn't seem to be possible. We live in a world that seems largely deterministic, but isn't wholly deterministic. We live in a world where we want to be certain, but can't. And we live in a world where we frequently have to make decisions and act upon the information that we have, and we don't seem to have access to certainty. And so we're constantly making decisions in the absence of this. We don't have sufficient information in many cases to warrant a clear, confident conclusion. And we live in a world where the most reliable information, the best understanding of the world that we inhabit, comes from scientific investigation, uh, a process of critical examination of evidence that doesn't make pronouncements about truth and doesn't give us absolute certainty, but instead creates probabilistic models that are the current tentative conclusions and the best understanding of the universe that we inhabit based on the information available. This can be very frustrating. This can be terrifying. If everything is subject to change at any time, what are we going to do? And so religions step in and say, hey, hang on. You can be absolutely certain of some things because there's a God who's absolutely certain. This God has complete knowledge and it is certainty. And you can then be certain because this being is certain. Now, I discussed this a bit when, we, when I had the debate with Cy Ten Bruggenkate, and I don't see how it's possible for a limited, flawed being, like a human being, to be granted access to absolute certainty by some other entity, God or not. If you have a flawed brain, if you live in this universe, um, I don't know how some other being's certainty can be transferred to you. I think probably what they're actually saying is, I can't actually be certain, but I am incredibly confident that there is a being who is. The good news here is that religions are destined to fail on this front as well. Um, the more we learn, the more we recognize that uncertainty is everywhere. And familiarity eases fears. If we look around the world and we start to begin to see uncertainty, that can be anxiety inducing. But once we realize that uncertainty is potentially everywhere, it loses its hold because we understand it a little better. For example, we don't understand everything about gravity. And there are a lot of people in a lot of situations who are very fearful of gravity and for very good reasons. If you're standing on the edge of the cliff and you don't have any support, it would be pretty wise. It would be a rational fear or a rational anxiety that you should be wary of the effects of gravity in that situation. But we don't live our daily lives walking around, even sitting on chairs. The chair could fail, you could fall, and falling sucks. We don't spend our lives in fear or in terror of gravity. 
And when we start to realize that uncertainty is everywhere and that the fact that we can't be certain about something does not mean that we can't be very confident. It doesn't mean that we don't have a good understanding. We may in fact have the best possible understanding and still lack certainty. And much in the same way that getting more comfortable with acknowledging that you don't know an answer is empowering because it allows you to go out and find an answer. Acknowledging that you don't have certainty is also empowering because you no longer have to fear uncertainty. If you realize that your goal of certainty may in fact be unreachable, then it allows you to set a much more reasonable goal, which is I want my internal model of reality to match the actual reality I experience as best as possible. And this puts us in a position where we can much more rationally assess our uncertainty to determine, is this something worth being afraid of or not? Another one of the big fears that religions uh, make use of is death. As a matter of fact, it's probably the first fear that people list. Our mortality is something we face all the time. Our ancient ancestors made some very flawed conclusions about life and death, but they had very good reasons. And with the information available at the time, it made the most sense. If I'm standing here talking to someone and they are a warm-bodied, living, moving, thinking, interactive uh, individual, and the next moment they're cold and laying on the floor and no longer responsive, there's a change, but there's a change there that I can't see. It is reasonable to surmise that perhaps the difference between this living talking individual and this deceased individual is that something left and this something needs to be invisible because I don't see any big difference. It may in fact be a warm something because they're warm while they're alive and they're cold once they're dead. And so our ancestors reach conclusions and the idea of a soul begins and the idea of a soul is pretty natural. But what does it mean? What does it mean to have a soul? How does a soul work? How does putting a label on this uh, spirit or this uh, movement inducing thing help us understand it at all? What does it feel like to die? What does it feel like to be dead? Does it feel like anything? Where does this soul go? And religions provide responses to these mistakes that our ancestors made. Um, and I say responses and not answers or explanations because explanations are uh, imbue an understanding. In order, to, when we explain something, we explain it in terms of other things that we understand, and this increases our understanding of the entire situation. But what they're offering isn't an explanation, it's barely even an answer, it's more of a response. It is a bald assertion that they can't demonstrate. And they create fanciful and comforting stories about wonderful places where the soul goes once it actually leaves the body. With no demonstration that there ever was a soul in the body, this is all um, a sort of supposition based on flawed premises to begin with. And once you have a really nice place that the souls go, it isn't much of a leap to realize, you know, there are people in this world who aren't as good as me, people in this world who I don't like, people in this world who I would not want to spend eternity with, what happens to their souls? Well, in some cases, if I don't necessarily hate them too much, they might go to their own paradise, or we might all get our own paradise. But in other cases, it's not much of a leap to say, ah, there's a terrible place of torment where their souls go so that they get their just rewards. And this solves our fear of injustice in the world as well. But in my opinion, the idea of a soul is probably the most obviously dead issue that religions have raised. Um, I don't think that religion is just doomed to fail on this topic. I think religions have already failed spectacularly, and it's becoming more and more obvious as we learn more about the brain. Um, we don't have time to go through all of the things that we have learned about the brain, and there's so much more to learn, but there's a number of great examples out there uh, from V.S. Ramachandran and other neuroscientists of weird, quirky little things about our brains. For example, a split-brain patient where you end up with two distinct personalities, which some would argue is actually two individual personas or people communicating independently in a single mind, and one would be a theist and one would be an atheist. But we know that everything that has been attributed to the soul that can be identified 
is a function of the brain. My memories, my personality, my preferences, uh, my emotions, uh, the controlling aspect of my actions. And if there's some sort of brain damage, we can erase, alter, or um, wipe clean, in some cases, many of those aspects. So people who suffer brain damage might, so, might lose their memory, they might lose their personality, their personality could change, uh, to the point where by most standards we would identify them as another person. So what happens with the soul that we seem to think is the captain of this ship in a sort of mind-body dualism sort of scenario? Uh, if the soul is desperately trying to control the brain but the brain's doing something else that is, let's say it's sinful, does the, brain, does the soul then get weighed down by the sin that the brain does even though the soul can't control it? Or if the soul is an incredible sinner and the brain decides the reason that it's time to accept Jesus as their personal savior, uh, does the soul automatically benefit from what the brain's doing now that the two aren't working together? When we do damage to the brain, are we also damaging a soul? If I was a Christian before and we wiped my memory and now I'm an atheist, uh, what happened? Did that soul, through a sheer you know, trauma to the head, become damned and vice versa? Nothing about the idea of a soul makes any sense. The things that make me me are clearly products of my brain. And when I talk about afterlifes and heaven and hell, the things that make me me don't seem to survive my death. And some people might say, you know, uh, there's a quote attributed to Mark Twain that he was dead for a billion years before he was born and it never bothered him one bit, so why should he be afraid of dying or being dead because being dead isn't like anything. But if I find myself in an afterlife of torment, I will still be comforted by my thoughts, my memories, and my understanding that I'm morally superior to whatever being is torturing me. And if that changes, you know, if he's tormenting me, he has to torment me with this entire package of things that makes me me. The freedom of the mind is inviolable. You cannot torture me and leave my mind as it is. And if you alter my mind, you're no longer torturing me, you're torturing some approximation of me. And therefore, I don't see anything to fear there. So religions exploit a lot of other fears as well, including the fear of loss of relationships, of, of finding yourself alone. And these are real fears, the fear of, of being alone, being ostracized, being unloved, uh, because we're communal beings, we interact, we benefit from working together, we recognize that there's a benefit from us working together. And so the fear of not being a part of that group is in fact very strong. Religions uh, deal with this by encouraging people to come together and to stay together and to build communities. And it not only that, but they provide the promise of a heavenly father quite often who loves you no matter what. Even if the rest of us think you're an ass and we ostracize you and we no longer have anything to do with you, at least there's some supernatural being who loves you unconditionally uh, and who is on your side and who's going to encourage more communities that might actually accept you as a family member. But religion is losing on this front. People are leaving religions. People are, relieving, are leaving churches. They're leaving the communities that they've built. They're also leaving families. Some people are divorcing. They're uh, in cutting off relationships um, because sometimes, as unpleasant as it is to hear, that's the best thing to do. Continuing to have a relationship with someone merely because they are a blood relative or they are part of this community that you've been a part of, even though it may be doing harm to your life, your psyche, your happiness, uh, is a mistake. And we have to recognize that sometimes separating, getting divorces, uh, moving on with your life, finding a new group is the best course of action. And this is in direct conflict with what many religions want to do. As a matter of fact, some of them have had such strong prohibitions on divorce and leaving um, that people have spent their entire adult lives and, and, well, maybe their entire lives because this affects children too, in torment and misery because they have placed their allegiance to the church and their religion ahead of their own well-being. And if there is a God, 
who doesn't care more about your well-being than the well-being of the church body construct in this, uh, this community that is doing harm to you. I don't, I don't see how that qualifies as a good being and I really wouldn't want anything to do with them. Uh, religious control over relationships is doomed to fail as people become empowered, as people become enlightened, and as people are emboldened to be themselves and care about themselves and love themselves. Embracing the differences uh, in others helps us recognize the value in differences and helps us value those differences in ourselves. Interacting with people and recognizing what kind of life you'd like to lead helps you to determine when a relationship may not be in your best interest. And being stuck in a relationship, being, having made a mistake and being forced to live the rest of your life inside of this mistake uh, is a mistake. It also, uh, religions also like to prey on this fear of living in an immoral world. We have to interact with people, we have to share space, we have to share things on occasion. Um, because we don't live in isolated little island clumps where it's just us. And so these interactions we know not everybody's going to do the right thing all the time. We have a fear of what people are going to do to us. Maybe they're going to steal our stuff or break our stuff or injure us or kill us um, or make our lives miserable. Maybe they'll use their power to make us a second-class citizen or worse. There's a fear that other people aren't good enough to control their urges. And there's a good reason for this fear. Because we all fail from time to time to do the right thing. When weighing the cost benefit of a particular decision, if the short term benefit to us is uh, incredibly high, and the risk of getting caught, and the risk of doing harm, uh, and the risk of finding out that there's perhaps a long term detriment to us, seems low, we struggle to make that decision even if it's clear that it might do harm to somebody else. Recognizing this failing and this, not, not even just the failing, recognizing that there's a struggle going on inside of us to try to do the right thing means that we recognize that the same struggle is going on in other people and we're not always confident that uh, they are perhaps as strong-willed as we are, that they are as likely to do the right thing. And so religions um, it, it tend to exploit guilt, and guilt is just the fear of being exposed and penalized for the things that you've done, and attempts to take the conscience that we all have, or most of us have, uh, and give it a, a foundation, a foundation beyond what I think are the good foundations for a conscience, which are empathy, and the recognition that you share space with other people and that your actions have consequences for yourselves and others and that you're responsible and maybe by taking responsibility for your action you can encourage other people to take responsibility as well. And instead religions give that conscience a foundation in the supernatural realm that God has written his moral code on your heart. Um, we're recognizing though that what religions often call moral isn't. In some cases it's outright immoral. We're learning more about it, what it means to be moral. And if that's the case, then we have to recognize that our ancient ancestors probably didn't know as much of, as we do about what it means to be moral. They probably didn't know as much as we do about how to encourage people to live a good life and to interact peacefully. Steven Pinker's written a really good book called The Better Angels of Our Nature that shows that despite the claims of the media and from the pulpit, the world is actually as good or better than it's ever been in almost every measurable criteria. The world is better. Don't fear the news reports. Don't fear the pronouncements of immorality coming from the pulpit. Just keep working to make the world better and religion will be doomed to fail on this front as well. We've already shifted the discussion about morality from assertions that atheists can't be moral to the recognition that well of course they can but they're co-opting religion or God's written their moral code on their heart so they Religions flailing around desperately trying to lash on and maintain its grip over discussions about morality. When many of the problems that we have when discussing morality are the result of religions poisoning the well. Telling us you need this or without this 
the world will fall apart. And now we're beginning to understand that those things not only aren't true, but they may be the source of more irrational fears in this arena, and it might all fade. So as we learn more about the world, we figure out where we went wrong in the past, and we work to change it so that we don't make the mistakes that we've made in the past in our future. But we fail. We are going to repeat some mistakes. We're going to repeat some mistakes because they're similar, because we are flawed beings who are, are doomed to keep betting on red or betting on black and thinking that we're due for a hit. Uh, religions have a very difficult time, if not an impossible time, of changing as new information is discovered. They're fairly rigid in structure, most of them. They, their holy texts were, were privately revealed uh, centuries, if not millennia ago, and they're written in stone. Or at least that's the impression that they'd like to give. The truth is that Christianity today is very, very different from what it was 2,000 years ago. And a lot of it has, has moved on to a sort of picking and choosing, a cherry picking from their holy scriptures so that their religion can progress, but it's very difficult. The world is changing, in some cases, faster and faster. And as a general rule, religion simply can't keep up with the changes at such a rapid pace. And that's why Christianity and other religions are a confused and confusing mess right now. This is why there's so many different denominations, why they disagree on nearly every tenet of theology or doctrine. This is why there's a gay Christian church and the anti-gay Westboro Baptist Church. This is why there's a, an atheist pastor at a Methodist church, even though that makes absolutely no sense to any of us. This is why there's a pope who is sending out conflicting messages and making pronouncements only to be uh, essentially corrected by the bishops, which demonstrates very clearly that this pope isn't infallible, which should make it clear to everybody that there probably has never been a pope that's infallible, and, it, and that it's absurd to think that, that there could be any individual who was infallible, even with the help of a god. Religions are, are flailing around because after so many years of instilling fears in people, because some of the things that uh, we are fearful of are fictions invented by our minds and then incorporated into religions. And not only does do religions fear, uh, exploit the, the fears that it has instilled, but it exploits the real fears that we have, the, the rationally based fears, but religions are losing and dying, and they are now afraid. And that's one of the beautiful things about dealing with this topic of fear and religion. When I say religions are, are, are afraid, I'm not talking about like an individual adherent or the person at the top of any particular religion. This is, this is kind of a generality. People who adhere to a religion are afraid, and they're afraid that their religion is in danger. They fight science in public school education and they engage in homeschooling with religious indoctrination because they are afraid, because the, the wisdom of the world that their Bible calls foolishness is taking hold, is changing the world, is making the world a better place. And the, er the arena in which their religion can operate is getting smaller and smaller. They know that higher education is killing off religious belief. For most of my adult life, there have been, uh, in Southern Baptist churches and others, a lot of cautions about sending your children to a secular university and that you should just go ahead and pony up the extra money to make sure you send them to a Baptist university or at least, you know, like a Catholic or Methodist university or Lutheran or something. Uh, because sending them to a secular university may well kill off their adherence to Christianity. They know this is the case. They're aware that the wisdom of the world is making the world better, and their religion doesn't seem to be. And what's happened in their mind is that while the world is actually getting better, they view this as a negative. The world is going to hell in a handbasket. It's the end times. Look at the world we live in. Everything is terrible, and it's, it's because you took God out of schools. It's because you took prayer out of schools. When we didn't take prayer out of schools, what we took was mandatory government-led, school-led, enforced prayer out of schools. Kids can still pray in schools. So fear 
is an incredibly strong motivator within our lives and within religion. And it's not enough just to say, don't be afraid and, and think that fears will simply vanish. The key to diminishing fears is education, critical thinking, and familiarity. Giving people the tools they need to assess whether or not a fear is rational. For example, I, I'm afraid that I might be, uh, I might catch this particular communicable disease. Okay, I can assess the risk factors there and figure out how reasonable is this fear, how likely is it to happen, how much caution should I exercise. And irrational fears, like I'm afraid, you know, that the ghost is going to turn off the alarm on my phone just to mess with me. We have no reason to think that there are ghosts or, or that they could interact with a phone or that there's any motivation for them to do so. And yet, we still have fears of some of those supernatural things, no matter how rational we are. You can't just eliminate fear by saying, oh, get over it, oh, don't be afraid. You eliminate and diminish fears and work to keep their effects at a manageable level by educating people and encouraging rational thought. But you have to recognize that fear is essentially emotional. It is, in, on many levels, it's subconscious. And so it's not just enough to think, now I'm a rational being, so I am now post-fear. I am now living in a non-fear world. I don't believe in ghosts. And I'd be happy to spend the night uh, in, a man, in a haunted mansion, whatever. Uh, I'd be happy to spend the night in any mansion, but a haunted mansion and you know, film the process. And I'm, I'm rational and I don't believe in ghosts. That doesn't mean that I'm not going to confront a fear of ghosts at some point. Um, this is not something that we do in a, in a thinking sense. This is kind of an emotional reaction. We've got this baggage, we've been fed stuff. And it's not even that I'm necessarily afraid of a ghost. If you're, if you're in a darkened house, th there's something eerie and discomforting about that. There, there are people who have hypothesized that one of the reasons we sleep is because that puts us into an unconscious state in, 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 at night when we are most vulnerable. Uh, in order to keep us from making mistakes and keep us living in anxiety and fear. That's one of many models for, uh, to try to explain sleep. But if you're in that situation in a house and you feel creepy, don't beat yourself up over it. Don't think that you're, you've slipped into irrational fears. These are very strong, perhaps even you know, ancestral lizard brain type motivations um, that have good reasons. The people who ran away from the rustling in the grass or think that, thought that they saw a face in the bushes and, and ran away were less likely to be eaten when it turned out that what they saw was actually a face or something harmful. And the same is true in the dark. The same is true of the unknown. How we decide to handle those fears is what's important. Instead of falling into the trappings of superstitions and religions, uh, I'll do my best to rationally evaluate the situation, take stock of it, and not rely so much on my personal experience, ooh, I think I saw something move, as if it's the, the, the overriding single most important factor into determining what it is that I experienced, if anything. Religions will fade their control will fade and it will happen because some of us will no longer be afraid. We'll no longer allow others uh, to make us fearful irrationally or to exploit the irrational fears that we already have or the rational fears that we should have. We'll no longer allow our fears to control us and we won't allow religions to use those fears to control us. We're stronger than that. We're, we're better than that. We aren't still mired in the Bronze Age. We're powerful, passionate people who are going to exercise reason and compassion, investigation and empathy, science and justice to take back the world from the fear mongers and the fearful. Because we can, because we have to, and because it's the right thing to do. And so when you're talking to believers, one of the questions you might ask is, what is it that you're afraid of? I mean, religion provides you comfort. It seems to ease your fears. And irrespective of whether or not your religious belief is actually true, what is it that you're afraid of that religion is allowing you to overcome? Is that fear irrational? What is religion doing or isn't your religion doing to overcome it? And is it the best way to overcome it? And if it turns out that your religion isn't true, are you stuck with that fear? Or 
is the recognition of that fear and the ability to investigate and to think critically and to recognize and become comfortable with uncertainty, with the unknown, with the possibility of loss, with the understanding that you can't control everything and everyone in the world, and with your own mortality. Is that possible to address and perhaps address better without a religion? Food for thought. This video is made possible by supporters of the Atheist Debates Patreon project. You can find more information and add your support at patreon.com slash atheistdebates.